Yes. With that intro, I will start. So, yeah, uh, we're here to talk about circuit breakers and how they can guard against cascading failure. Uh, my name is Philip Dexter. I uh, yeah, I'm a Python software engineer at Volt. I've been here for about seven months working on the consumer-facing backend. So, as mentioned, what people see when they open the app and search for food using promo codes. OK, uh, so first off, what is a cascading failure? Um, so yeah, there's this kind of definition here. So cascading failure is a process uh, where kind of failure of one part can cause failure of other parts, lots of other parts, and so on. Um, I think I got this from Wikipedia, though, so it might not be correct. But um, we can basically take an example here where there's a server um, on the back end. There's a lot of clients accessing it. Um, so every request goes to the database. Usually, response is quick on the order of milliseconds, let's say. And everything is going fine. A uh, high number of requests per second. And now if we kind of imagine that the database is is down for whatever reason, um, so what would happen? So a uh, server will start having timeouts to the database, maybe 10 seconds, let's say. There's kind of now this uh, traffic jam happening at the server. Um, and it itself kind of becomes overloaded. And uh, clients will probably start timing out to the server. And uh, we can call this kind of a cascading failure. So database came down, means the server is coming down. And um, yeah, so this isn't like an easy, easy thing to account for. There are a lot of famous, famous companies, big companies that have had these sort of <laughs> Yeah, the AWS outage was it yesterday might have been related. We don't know yet, but there's a Gmail outage 2012, lots of power outages. Uh, 2003, I guess, was a bad year for for electricity. Um, Dynamo outage in 2015, where kind of this uh, storage server is overloaded, this metadata service, which every, every uh, storage server needed. And then the storage servers themselves came down. Um, Facebook outage had a kind of misconfigured router, which sends lots of traffic where it shouldn't exist or shouldn't have gone. And um, yeah, back Valentine's Day in Volt, even we had kind of a similar error where a database which uh, ran out of memory, which itself shouldn't be an issue, but then a lot of systems started having timeouts. I mean. Similar story to all of these, all of these issues. So if we go back, if we go back to the uh, initial situation, kind of the idea here, the whole idea of circuit breaker, is to, if if the server can realize that the database is not responding, then maybe maybe stop like asking the database for, for data. You can try again after a while. And if it's still down, uh, still don't try to access the database. Um, you can introduce some sort of exponential back off here or, or whatever. So first time, wait one second. Second time, wait two. Maybe next time, wait six or whatever, whatever you want to do. Um, the idea here is, though, just don't uh, wait on the database when you know, um, given recent history, that going to respond. Yeah, and then uh, if you kind of realize after a while that it's back up, uh, you know, if you've, if you've been waiting five seconds and you notice it's up, then you can start sending the rest of the traffic um, to the database. And in the meantime, maybe you had some sort of like a fallback that you can send to the clients um, or other kind of way to serve that request um, that's still made sense, hopefully. And we'll, we'll get into some fallback scenarios later. And yeah, so this is the idea of the circuit breaker. 
uh, it kind of lives theoretically in between the server and the database. So usually it's it's more or less built into the server. And there's a little bit of state involved, which is like that little picture under the other picture, which we'll get in, into the next slide. And the important thing here is to note it's uh, it's protecting uh, the resource, in this case, the database. Um, the database might be struggling itself to to hit these timeouts. So it's good to back off a little and give it some some space to uh, figure itself out. And um, it's also protecting the server because as we know in cascading failures, you know, if the database goes down, we don't want the server to also go down. So we're, we're protecting both, both things here. And um, it doesn't have to be just protecting like a database, for example. It can be protecting like a third party service, like some other company that you, you call out to or it could be um, some other internal service that, that you, you own, but it doesn't necessarily have to, like some HTTP API, for example, internal. Um, yeah, so let's kind of get into some nitty gritty, though it's, it's not too complicated, but this, the, uh, the circuit breaker has three states and um, kind of counterintuitively, the happy state is called closed. Uh, which I always mess up, so I might mess up in this talk. Um, but yeah, so closed state means the database, uh, the server can can call the database, so everything is fine. Um, yeah, and then given some sort of um, threshold, which we'll get into a little later as well, like for example, three out of ten. So a three out of ten uh, request to the database, either timeout or or fail in some other way then we're gonna switch the circuit breaker to this open state, which is as if it was, the circuit breaker has like kind of tripped. So what this means is that uh, no future calls, at least for like a second or whatever, whatever the timeout is, will be allowed to the, to the database. Um, and then there's, there's kind of this in between, in between state, which is called half open. And what this means is that the circuit breaker is going to allow uh, a single call through to the database. So after one second, two seconds, whatever, one call is gonna go through. If that one fails, we're gonna stay open. If it succeeds, then it's kind of a good indicator that the database is back in some, some way or form, and we're gonna go to the closed state, which would allow uh, now all of, the, all of the calls to go through. And the failures don't have to be uh, consecutive. So for example, three out of 10, it could be, um, doesn't have to be three in a row, just whatever you keep track of. Yeah, and we can kind of start looking at what kind of we've, we've built and how we're using circuit breakers in, in our kind of consumer, consumer um, API. And um, so one note actually this, in the in the code, I actually have this uh, like R API breaker. So that kind of uh, is a name that leaked from uh, from the code into this slide. So um, you can just or the R API at the beginning, I guess, unless you know <laughs> what it means. Um, so yeah, so this is how we use breakers. So we we've kind of built it so that um, right. So you first have to design your breaker. What kind of like uh, failure limits you're willing to accept? Um, and then there's this thing called window size, which is like the number of recent uh, calls that you keep track of. So what this means here is that uh, out of the last 100 calls, if three of them, or when three of the last 100 calls fail, we're going to switch to the uh, open, open state. And we have some uh, two, two kind of back offs. So the initial back off is like how much time you want to wait um, before you initially try like the uh, half open state. So for example, if this has three, three failures, we're gonna wait one second until we try again. And we're gonna uh, do some sort of exponential back off until 10 seconds. So first time one, two, like uh, four, eight, and then max, max 10. So we never wait longer than, than 10 seconds. And um, there's also a little that's not shown here. For example, we have like some uh, Callbacks that you can you can use as well on on open and on on closed states state transitions, 
And uh, there's a way to configure these through um, some environment variables as well, um, through runtime configuration. But anyways, after you've designed your breaker, you're going to actually uh, wrap the function, like where you want to guard these breakers. For example, here we have this uh, like uh, do stuff with DB function that we're going to make like a breakered version of it, just called uh, breaker <laughs> do stuff with DB. And at that point, you kind of list the exceptions that you want to uh, count as failures. So in this case, we can say uh, any timeouts or connections, for example, these were like PyMongo exceptions, um, those will count it as failures. So three timeouts or three connection errors or whatever will we'll trip this breaker. And uh, yeah, and then the final step, of course, is to call this this new version of uh, do stuff with DB. And um, yeah, and then there's kind of this uh, way to use a fallback on a breaker open. So we have this other exception that we raise if um, if the breaker is is open when when you try to call the function. Um, yeah, usually we we kind of treat all exceptions the same here. So whether or not it was a timeout, connection error, or if the breaker was open, we usually have the same sort of fallback. But there there might be cases where you want to change the fallback based on if it was um, like maybe a temporary connection error or if actually the service is having trouble. And uh, yeah, just kind of to like uh, show other features that we have with this circuit breaker that we've built. So we have uh, also this, um, this con context manager way of doing things. So this is the case, like if you don't maybe have access to the, like the function that you're trying to call, like source access to the function, or if you just have several functions in a row, you want to all kind of wrap with the same uh, circuit breaker. So you can use it this way as well. And um, yeah, I'm gonna kind of introduce this topic of breaker granularity, which is um, very interesting in, in its own. So, so if we kind of look at how we've used the breaker so far, and that is, um, yeah, we can imagine this handle request function, like let's say it, it's like a view or something, like some, some endpoint, and it, it tries to do something with the database, and if it fails, or if it's open, then we're going to kind of like uh, return an, an exception or return an error. And um, yeah, we can kind of imagine that the thing we want to do with the database is only part of the response. So looking beyond this trivial example, so for example, maybe it calls other services as well, looks some stuff up in Redis, and then returns some like giant JSON structure where like the value we get from this database call is only like one small part. So it would be kind of a shame that if if the database is down, like we don't, we suddenly stop returning for like every call to to this endpoint. Um, like for example, if if the database lookup was to find some estimate, so just because we can't find an estimate like temporarily, we don't have to uh, return like a I don't know, 500 or some other error to to the clients. So. Um, yeah, it's like a case by case basis. But for example, um, if we were to take what we've written so far, this do stuff with DB, kind of looking into what maybe could could be doing. So let's say that it's getting like the recent purchases from the database, um, and then it's using like another like a number of couriers, for example, from Redis, and then it's like combining those to create some sort of estimate. So, um, so there might be a way to handle this where we don't have to take the entire endpoint down just because like Redis is, is down temporarily. Um, yeah, so, so in this example, kind of maybe a good outcome would be if, if the database is down or Redis are down, we can kind of have some sort of like static like uh, fallbacks that we can use temporarily if, if the services are having trouble. So let's say database is down uh, and the breaker is open, or even if it has a timeout. Um, we could set 
like for example, just use like 30 as the uh, mean delivery time. Like maybe we look up and we find like our mean delivery time over the past month or past years is 30. So we can just use that in place. We can't, in, in case we can't calculate it on the fly. Uh, number of couriers, same thing. I don't know. Maybe we pick 20. Or maybe there's another fallback we can use, like um, like some sort of in-memory Python like cache that we could use um, uh, in case Redis is unreachable. Yeah, and um, I think now it's a good time to go through some of the challenges we've had with with the circuit breakers. Um, there are several. Um, so, so one kind of issue is it's it's kind of always important to know what you depend upon and how they can fail. And like when you're using circuit breakers, at least this implementation, it's really uh, beneficial to know what exceptions are thrown. Uh, so for example, if you have an endpoint that you have several circuit breakers, and let's say they're guarding against uh, like PyMongo, MongoDB exceptions, uh, and then you realize that actually uh, Redis is down, and now the endpoint is like throwing Redis, Redis exceptions. And it's kind of too late at that point. Uh, like the circuit breaker isn't going to know what to do because it's, it's only reacting to PyMongo exceptions, so you're, you're going to go down anyway. So cascading failure and um, so one one option could be that you can react to all exceptions so instead of saying specifically pi mongo timeout or whatever you can just react to like exception base base class and um, that could work in some cases it's not really feasible where we use them because a lot of um, like semantical exceptions like 404s or validation errors are, are also thrown as exceptions so we wouldn't, wouldn't want to close the circuit breaker just because like someone's sending bad data like for a 30 seconds straight so we wouldn't want to you know ruin the um, experience for other clients and um another thing kind of related to this we found helpful is to create a circuit breaker that just reacts to all possible io exceptions so we've kind of listed all of the um, possible services in, in this API that we depend upon. And we kind of list all their except IO exceptions that they could throw. And we kind of can use that as a last resort on uh, some of the endpoints where we don't have time to go into finer grained um, kind of exception, exception handling. Um, yeah. Yeah, and kind of another issue that's a little um, unique to how we deploy the, the service. So we have uh, Kubernetes, we have uh, lots of uh, nodes, and then each node uh, runs GUnicorn, and each worker of GUnicorn has its own memory. So, so what this actually ends up meaning is that we have lots of uh, lots of instances of each circuit breaker. So let's say we have 100 nodes and like every node has like two or three or whatever workers. And let's say we have, I don't know, like 30 circuit breakers in the application. So in the end, there, there's actually a lot of, of um, instances of identical circuit breakers, which means depending on like which node is like routed traffic and whatnot, it can take a while for all of the circuit breakers to open if the database is down, for example. So if the database is, is struggling and it can't hit timeouts, um, it could take a while. Like we still might be sending a lot of traffic in the meantime. And then if you factor in timeouts and the half open state, um, it could be an issue. So kind of one kind of thought exercise that we've had is we could like kind of replicate some of this state um, to, for example, Redis. So like every circuit breaker could have some sort of entry in Redis that could like force it, force it to like one state or the other. Or like if one of the nodes um, trips a circuit breaker, it could, it could kind of um, fast fail the other circuit breakers as well. And uh, we thought a bit about this, but 
in the end, I don't, I don't think it really makes sense because um, the kind of point of cir circuit breakers is to avoid these single points of failure. And uh, it would kind of be unfortunate if Redis <laughs> was to go down and then the circuit breakers somehow wouldn't be able to communicate with each other and they would stop working. And um, for example, what if some of the nodes can hit Redis, but some others can't? Um, kind of the current implementation where every worker has its own copy uh, works really well in those sort of like uh, split net uh, network partition cases. So I don't know. We're still thinking about it. But in the end, if you if you kind of read these online resources, uh, kind of this distributed circuit breaker pattern is not recommended like at all. So I guess there's a good um, good like sign that we also didn't reach for it too eagerly. Yeah, and uh, tuning your circuit breakers is is also extremely important. So, so for example, if you're setting up a new a new circuit breaker, you have like some new external service or just an existing one you're adding a circuit breaker to. Uh, it involves a lot of guesswork related to like timeouts, uh, related to like the fail limit, or like the the window window size. For example, like some services might just fail like <laughs> sometimes. Or like maybe your service has like really tight uh, timeout timeouts for this external service, um, and if that's the case, and the external service uh, is having a hard time fulfilling those timeouts, not because it's overloaded, just because it's uh, I don't know, it's slow, for example, um, like it's not hitting its SRE, um, then you should probably loosen the restrictions of the circuit breaker. Otherwise, you're you're going to be tripping the circuit breaker constantly. And um, which which is probably not ideal because again it's not overloaded it's just slow, so it's very important to after you create the circuit breakers to go back and kind of revisit like are we using the right settings like what can we change here, and um, this also op opens up other opportunities to like um, if there's a service that's not critical for uh, for your 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 own service. Then it might make sense to have higher higher timeouts. Like if you overload the database, and it's not such a critical service that you can live without the database, or you have like pretty good fallbacks that can offer like um, kind of decently close answers approximations if the database is down, then maybe a timeout of like 30 seconds is fine to give that service like more time. And you can even have like uh, different timeouts for like different um, deployments or different um, different endpoints even. So like, for example, if, uh, if like Redis is down, like maybe the search endpoint doesn't really use it that, that like, it doesn't really need it that badly. You can operate without it for a while. So maybe that one will have a higher timeout. Um, well, maybe like your front page endpoint, for example, would have like a much, much lower timeout, uh, much stricter circuit breaker settings. Um, so we have, we have several instances of that. Um, where we have different timeouts or different configurations based on what service is calling what other service. And yeah, to kind of wrap things up, um, kind of the take home message, message is that it's really important to know like what you depend upon. So what, like, uh, <laughs> If you look at this endpoint, what does it actually call? Does it use Redis? Does it use like local um, in-memory cache? Does it use a database? It's also important to know uh, how it fails. So like, um, I guess literally in this case, you need to know what exceptions it throws. Um, it's also good to know uh, maybe how often it should fail. And then of course, look back at the settings later. Um, redundancies like smart fallbacks are, are very important. And uh, yeah. Try circuit breakers. And I think that is it. Oh, yeah, I have some links. So um, there's this initial like Martin Fowler post on circuit breakers, which is pretty, pretty cool. And there's several implementations I found. So in the JVM world, I've been told this resilience for J is, is quite popular. It has a circuit breaker implementation. There's also these two other Python uh, implementations I found, and then some random. Uh, go one with a lot of stars on GitHub. So I listed it here. And yes, that's it.
Great. Thanks, Philip, for the awesome and interesting presentation. We actually have a couple of questions from the audience. Firstly, what kind of performance tests do you typically run? Have you simulated the audits situations in the performance tests? And I think the guest here is referring to the Valentine's Day massacre situation. Uh, okay, yeah, so performance tests, we, we um, it's kind of on a team by team basis here. Like, so we personally have done performance tests for the front page, for search page, um, probably some other random ones that I can't remember right now. As far as the Valentine's Day <laughs> massacre, um, that was actually before I joined. And I think, so, so this kind of circuit breaker um, movement within the company is kind of the outcome of that and maybe some other outages as well. Um, the others don't have catchy names though. So um, as far as the Valentine's Day massacre, yeah, I, I assume, um, yeah, to actually simulate those in the, oh yeah, okay. So I can tell tell this one story. We actually did hit a, a, hit a bug in our uh, circuit, breaker, circuit breaker implementation when we were, when we were load testing. Um, something to do with like uh, timeouts and uh, like uh, it was basically uh, calculating a very extremely high like uh, back off exponential back off. There's some um, like rounding or some issue there with the time delta, I think. So I guess we haven't tested in like actually taking a service down and then seeing how they react, but kind of in some ways we, we've tested that. Great, thanks. Then another one completely different was a uh, pops up approach or Kafka or some message queue compared with the direct DB access management? Uh, yeah, this yeah, I guess is another quite a different topic. Um, I can say that there are some HTTP internal endpoints, which we've been moving towards uh, Kafka for those. So that is definitely like something we are looking into like per per use case. Um, that usually takes more effort though than like slapping a circuit breaker on onto the endpoint. Um, but I think slowly we are moving towards that that direction. And then one from the from the chat. So is our circuit breaker open sourced? And if not, do we have plans? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, we, yeah, we, we we recently extracted the circuit breaker like the source code from this like one service that we kind of initially built it into this more general Volt Python utils library. So I guess if we if we take one step further, the next step would be to kind of open source that and try to get that into the uh, more general public. So I would be excited to do that. Yeah, but currently, you know, it's not open source. Great, thanks, thanks, Philip. And you can keep on writing the questions in the Q and I. I'm sure Philip will be happy to answer there. And yes, very happy. Should we get some applause for Philip? 